Now, I'm going to need some clarity on what you told me. You said that you like picking blackberries off the side of the road. I, I really would like to get some clarity on that, but I guess I'll have to save that for another time. Uh, so everyone, please welcome Jacqueline. Um, so just for the fact, uh, blackberries grow on bushes all over roads here in the Seattle area. And um, yeah, one of my favorite hobbies is just walking off the side of the road and grabbing the blackberries. So they're not off the ground. They're not from people selling them. They're somewhere in between the two. So hi, I'm Jacqueline Nolis. My Twitter handle is at Sky Tetra, and this is about my website, Tweet, Mashup, and R, and what I learned from porting my viral website from .NET to Shiny. So part one, what is Tweet Mashup? So before I even get into that, don't go to tweetmashup.com yet. You're going to be inclined to, during this whole presentation, go to tweetmashup.com. But don't go. There are spoilers there, and we don't want spoilers. You want the max intrigue of this presentation. So don't go there yet. So Tweet Mashup was a website I made that let you take two different Twitter accounts and take tweets from them and mash them up into a new funny tweet. You could select from like pre uh, six pre-selected pairs to tweet uh, mashup, or you could make your own pairs of accounts. Um, so you could put in Twitter accounts, it generate funny tweets like the thing at the bottom. Um, and so people had fun with this on the internet. It took me like a year to develop the website and then I launched it and people were doing funny things like it. Like here's one, I'm not gonna release tweets out loud because um, it's funnier if you just read them, but I'm gonna give you a second to take in that joke. Um, here's another good joke, I think that tweet mashup generated. Um, and here is um, a little bit more about it. So the website was launched in 2016. It went viral within like three days and it to the point where it at one point had 3000 people concurrently viewing the website, um, all low, like putting it under load at the same time. And so because of that, it crashed a lot at first. Um, I had no idea people were going to like this website so much. And so I didn't think about how it handled that scale. And then eventually, after a couple of weeks, it stopped being so popular. But during that like viral bump, I actually got like mentioned on The Verge. That article on the left is me being mentioned on The Verge website. Um, and then on the right, that's John Ledger, who has like three or four million followers tweeting about my website. Um, so we've got a lot of traffic that I wasn't expecting. Um, but here's the secret. Here's the secret. I didn't make it an R. I actually programmed it in my favorite programming language, F Sharp. And now you're like, oh, Jacqueline Nolis, you're presenting at an R conference. You presented at R Studio Conf. You seem so much like an R person, but actually F Sharp's my favorite language. Um, and F Sharp is, it's basically, it's a functional programming language. So if you know the R package per, which is fantastic, F Sharp is basically a whole programming language that's based on um, that philosophy of using um, maps and rocks and things like that. And .NET is the framework that contains F Sharp. It's for most like modern Windows development it uses .NET, or if you ever heard of C Sharp, which is like one of the most popular programming languages in the world, that's .NET and F Sharp is the functional equivalent. And so it's a very mature platform, which means it's very good at handling things like scale and creating websites. Um, but like I said, it wasn't ready to scale. I launched it on Sunday, on a Sunday night, I shared it with my friends and I like, you know, I'm like for fun, I'm gonna spend 10 bucks on Twitter ads. But my friends started tweeting about it, which somehow got it to the supernatural fandom starting to tweet about it, which started to get it to the anime fandom and then 4chan and then alt-right. And this all happened over the course of like three hours. And then suddenly, boom, everyone was tweeting about this website. Um, and so here on the left, you can see immediately it started crashing. Tweet mashup, more like tweet crash up. You know, that's me getting burned. Um, so I had some unrealistic assumptions. Also, by the way, this talk is filled with jokes. And normally when I give talks, people laugh at the jokes, but there's no one here but me. So I'm assuming everyone's laughing when I'm saying these things, that it's very funny. So anyway, so I had some unrealistic assumptions. Um, I assumed I didn't have to worry about Twitter API limits because I didn't think I'd have that much scale. I assumed that memory wouldn't be an issue, that money of the, the, the server size I'd on wasn't be an issue, and that it would only be used by people in the US. Um, so if you look on the left, this is a tweet from Brazil that got 4,000 retweets. I don't get the joke. I don't speak Portuguese, but um, I'd even consider that when I was thinking about how the mashups were made. So a lot of things I wasn't ready for. But I learned that memes fall hard. So like I said, it launched on that Sunday. It peaked on that Wednesday. There's one hour, one hour where I had about 20,000 views. And then forever after that, it declined. 
And so it went from that 200,000, a single day with 200,000 sessions to eventually down to about 1,000 sessions a day for like years after that. So it went pretty quickly, you know, even after two weeks, it was already pretty quickly just about done. But eventually I decided to pull the web plug on the website because what would happen was about every three months, Twitter would change around how the authentication works for the Twitter API, which meant that the C Sharp library that handled Twitter changed, which meant my code had to change and I had to go in and edit around F Sharp code. And this was annoying because every three months I'd get emails and things like that saying, hey, the site is down, can you fix it? Hey, hey. And it felt like a big emotional burden. And this is already after the huge emotional burden of it crashing a lot in the first place. And like, I just had a lot of too much emotions tied up in this website. So I finally, after a couple of years said, you know what, I'm pulling the plug, no more maintaining F sharp code for me. And so if you went to tweetmashup.com, you would see this, sorry, we can't reach the web page um, site. And to the point that someone actually even just recreated the site I made um, with their own version called Twit Combined. It's not Tweet Mashup, it's Twit Combined. And here it's the exact same website, but they just put ads on it and they remade it themselves, um, which is fine. As long as people on the internet had some way of doing this mashup. Uh, I kind of moved on with my life for a little bit. And yeah, like I said, there's just a ton of emotion tied up into trying to keep this website alive and all like, you know, all the tweet crash up burns and stuff is just like, it was too much for me. Which brings me to part two, porting this tweet mashup to Shiny. I had this idea one day what if I tried taking that tweet mashup site and I remade it? And instead of being in .NET, I did it in Shiny. Now this, in theory, would solve my problem of when the website going down, not having, not being annoyed having to go in and fix it. Because I'm like, well, if it's in Shiny and R, I know these tools so much better than F Sharp because I don't really use F Sharp anymore. So it's going to be a lot more enjoyable experience to fix it. Um, you know, Shiny is just much more continuously maintained. There's a much bigger R community. It feels like a, and it'd just be fun to see if it's even possible to take this website I made in .NET that had this big scale, things like that went viral. If I could even make it in Shiny, is it even possible? I think it'd be a fun test. So I one day I said, you know what? I'm gonna try doing it. Let's see if I can make this in Shiny. And you know, this is an R, R conference, so I'm glad we got to the R part. So here were the goals. I wanted to do five things when I recreated the site besides just make it work. One, I wanted to ensure that the full functionality of .NET was there. So I needed to be able to like pull in tweets, mash them up, show them on a website. Like, can I just do the core basic things I need? Two, I wanted to be visually similar to .NET. So any visual things I could do in .NET, I wanted to be able to see in Shiny as well. Um, three, I wanted the UI to be as snappy as .NET. So if it works in Shiny, but every time you try and make a mashup, it like takes, you know, takes a couple seconds, like that's a, that's a miss. Four, I wanted it to handle the same load as .NET. So, Ideally, it should be able to handle 3,000 concurrent users. I mean, I don't know if we get there again, ever again, but it should be able to do that in theory if I wanted. And five, it should be able to deploy as easily as .NET. So um, I should be able to take it from running on my computer to running somewhere in the cloud pretty easily. Okay, so again, don't go to tweetmashup.com. Don't go yet, please, spoilers. But I wanna show you that it does exist. So um, are you guys all still there? Great, so here we go. So this is the local version. And here's Tweet Mashup, and this is all in Shiny. So here's Sky Tetra, mashed up with CNN. And I can hit go. Um, this is all live ammunition I'm firing. I haven't pre-selected these Tweet Mashups in advance. I don't know if they're funny or advanced, uh, offensive, but um, you can see here, every time I click this Shiny app, it actually creates a new mashed up tweet between me and CNN. So in theory, yes, this does work. Um, so a little bit of a you know spoiler, but like I did recreate the site in Shiny, which is pretty cool. But what did I learn along the way? Um, so first off, number one, does it have that functionality of .NET? So first off, yes. The tweet mashing logic of, I need to take two Twitter accounts, pull their tweets together and put them into one tweet, absolutely easy to do in R. Um, there's really just one package that you need to do this, which is the R tweet package, um, primarily from Michael Kearney. And what this package does is it does all sorts of Twitter API things for you. So like pulling the tweets in from users, mashing the tweet, or, you know, pulling the tweets in from users. And then I just use string manip manipulation, you know, basically stringer stuff to just turn those sets of tweets into one new tweet. Um, so actually getting the tweet mashing logic was pretty easy. The Twitter authentication was a little trickier. So actually, so if you look here, we're going to go back to the site for a second. And so this is the one running locally on my computer. So I'm gonna go from a new private browser. So if I go from a private browser and I go to tweet mashup, 
if you'll notice, I don't have the ability to type in tweets right away. What I have to do first, I have to authorize the app. And I have to do this for Twitter API reasons. Otherwise, um, my app will get cut off from Twitter, um, which is what happened the first week I launched it and I had to switch to this version. So anyway, so if you want to actually mash up a tweet, the first thing you need to do is hit authorize. And what that does is that will pass you to Twitter. So if you see the URL is actually twitter.com. We put in your username and email. And then when you hit authorize app, then it'll bring you back to this version where you actually can type in stuff. And that's really important for tweet mashup to work. Um, and it turns out the functionality was not there in Shiny to do this, in R to do this. There's no package to do it, but it's easy for me to code it myself. So basically, all I had to do to make that flow work of you click authorize, you go to tweet mashup or to Twitter, and then you come back to Shiny. I had to just reverse engineer a little bit of the R tweet app uh, package um, to get that Twitter part working. And then you want to store in the browser. Um, you want to store that the person's logged in. So like, if you refresh the page, you don't want to have to go through that whole process again. So use the package called ShinyJS to keep track of the cookies um, using JavaScript. I didn't even have to use any JavaScript. I just copied and pasted it from the internet. But basically, the point is I was able to, with a little bit of you know work on my part, get this flow working. And if you want to get this flow working, you too can use um, the code I wrote by if you go to the um, this link at the bottom. I wrote a whole blog post on how to get this working. Um, so it's a good time. Another great thing I found in Shiny was actually storing data. So if you think about it, for this app to work, I want to be able to store. You know, Every time I want to mash up two sets of users' tweets, I don't want to have to go back to Twitter and ask for the, all those users' tweets again, right? because people don't tweet very often. So I really want to cache that data. I really want to store it in memory. So every time I do a new mashup, I can just pull from the data I already got from the Twitter API, and I don't have to pull it again. But it's important that, one, this data doesn't take over the entire hard drive. If I have 3,000 people using this concurrently, I can't just have my all my memory taken up. So I need to have some hard limit on, hey, don't use more than n megabytes of memory when you're storing this data. Also, I want to keep it fresh. Because after like a day of the data being pulled, I want you to go, like, you know, if you pull the stuff for the My Sky Tetra account, after a day, I want you to go pull it again, just in case I did make a new tweet, and in which case, um, you know, I want to refresh the data. So I need this some sort of max age where if the, the data is older than a certain amount of time, then just throw it away and pull the new stuff. And so I needed that both for storing tweets that people have made, and I also need it for storing user credentials. And so Shiny's memory cache is just like the perfect solution for me. Um, you just use Shiny memory cache, you pass the max size. So like I want 256 megabytes of memory. Uh, I want to discard after a certain number of seconds, in this case, one day. And if the data is missing, return null which will me let me know that if the data is not stored in my cache, I need to go pull it again and then save it in the cache. And I was just very pleased with this functionality because this is something that's really important to making like a mature production ready app. And it was just right built into Shiny and I had no idea. So that was a fun lesson. Two, I want it to be visually similar to .NET. Um, so first off, it really needs to have a customizable color palette. And I put like, flying stars to Shiny here. Uh, in particular, our studio has a new package called Bootstrap Lib. And it's on GitHub, and it is an absolute delight. So if you've ever wanted to make your Shiny apps look styled beyond the boring gray and blue that comes default in Shiny, um, this package is really just fantastic. Um, because with a few function calls, you just you can style your app and get like all the colors and fonts and things like that the way you like it. So for instance, I use this bootstrap theme app variables, and I set the primary and secondary color to the sea foam green. And then suddenly that sea foam green is throughout my website. I don't know if you saw, but the like go button, the banner, the, the links, they're all that color correctly. And so just by like one function call at the start of your shiny code, you now have things colored the way you like it. Um, I learned about this at an RStudio Conf by uh, Joe Chang. RStudio Conf talk, talk this year by Joe Chang. It was just fantastic. And it's a really good um, primer on why this stuff is interesting and matters and can really help. So if you, if you want to make your shiny app look pretty, and you want to do more than just like a basic theme, but you don't want to have to go and edit CSS and like weird files like that yourself, this package is simply fantastic. But for this app, I actually did need to do some custom CSS as well. So for instance, if you look at that center mashup thing, I need CSS to make these circles with our pictures. And I need CSS to make these things right aligned and these left aligned and this, you know, that sort of like, that sort of stuff is all custom CSS. So this is actually really easy because I had a CSS file that I made for my original tweet mashup, and I literally just copied and pasted it into my Shiny app, and it worked. So then when I was editing my Shiny code, like in my UI, for instance, if I had like a div, I would just use the, the, the class from my CSS file in the Shiny app, and it totally worked. Um, so 
you know, if you're not comfortable with familiar with CSS yet, I get that it can be pretty intimidating. Also, I keep looking down because I keep checking my time and my phone locks and that's a problem, but I still care about you. I'm paying attention. Uh, <laughs> I'm not texting during my own talk. That would be weird. Um, so if you're not comfortable with this stuff, I get it. It can be pretty intimidating, but I don't think it is really that hard to get stuff working. So I highly recommend you just try it to see how it goes. But first, then we come to our first real miss. And is it as snappy as .NET? Um, and for some reason, if you hit go on this app and these people aren't already in my cache to try and get the tweets from, I have to go to Twitter API and pull it. And it can take 20 or 20 seconds for the pull to happen. And this is maybe like, maybe on, on, um, on .NET, it would be in like one or two seconds. And so this is like, it's a real buzzkill because what happened is that you'd hit go and just nothing would be on the screen. So if you're a user who's not used to tweet mashup, you'd have no idea what's happening and you think the site's broken. Um, I'm not sure if there's really a way to speed up this Twitter pull without understanding more of how our tweet works in the inner workings. And that was a level of digging into someone else's package. That I'm like, I don't really want to do this. Um, so that was kind of a bummer. Um, and maybe there's some optimizations I didn't know about that I could have made, but I just, I couldn't get this that snappy and I was disappointed by that. Um, and then another thing, I'm like, well, I can't make it snappy. At least maybe I can have some sort of loading screen to let people know that, hey, this is loading in new tweets from the Twitter API. And so I looked into this um, shiny CSS loaders package, which puts like, here's like a little GIF showing you what the, um, like a loading UI would happen while the part of the UI is loading in shiny. And at first I'm like, oh, this is perfect because it just shows you that as we're waiting for the shiny, the Twitter mashup results, or sorry, the Twitter API pull to get the new data in that, hey, this is gonna be um, taking a second. But the issue was I really didn't have that much control over it because I wanted to show that that loading screen when you're doing the 10 second pull, but I didn't want to show that loading that loading animation just flash for a second while we're waiting for the new, you know, every time it, once it's pulled, every time you then generate more, I didn't want to show there. And I couldn't really get that to work. So I couldn't, if I had these super nitty gritty, like, oh, I want the animation here, but not this time, things like that, then Shiny kind of fell apart um, compared to .NET. And I think, um, you know, maybe there's a way again to do this in Shiny and I just don't know it yet. It's entirely possible I'm the limitation here, but it just, it seemed like a lot of work that was more effort than it's worth. And this is something that was a lot easier in .NET. So again, kind of felt like a little bit of a miss on Shiny side. But here's the big miss, which is that there's no way Shiny can handle the load of .NET. Um, so I don't know if you know how much you, the audience, know how much that Shiny actually handles concurrency. But the way Shiny works is that there's only one session of R running when Shiny is running. So that means if one person is asking Shiny to go use the Twitter API to pull a new user's information, then then that 10 second block, not only are they blocked, but literally any other user of the site is also blocked. Um, so that's a real problem. If it takes 10 seconds, I can't have every, you know, all these chunks of 10 seconds where my entire site goes down for everyone else. Now there are a couple of solutions for this. One, you can use Shiny Server Pro, which does allow you to have multiple R threads at once but it's very not free. We're talking about thousands of dollars. Another thing you could do is use Kubernetes to do load balancing and have like 20 Shiny server free running and you just balance people on that. But that's also not very free to have 20 Docker containers or whatever running at the same time. And then lastly, there's a newer tool called Shiny Async, which lets you actually have a separate like version of our call to do like a long running task so it doesn't block your Shiny. But I haven't really learned how to use it yet. It seems kind of confusing and I just like, I've already put so much time into this project. I don't want to learn that. And so, I mean, but even if it gets that gets working, I, I'm really struggling to see a universe where Shiny could handle 3,000 concurrent users like F Sharp did two days after my site went viral. So, uh, I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to dig the product or our studio here, but if you're looking at having that level of um, traffic on your site, you're not going to be able to do it for free in Shiny in the way you could do it for free in um, .NET. So that's kind of a that that felt like a mess. But a not miss was deploying it. Um, so deploying it went really well. So what I did was, you know, over the last year, several years, I've been learning a lot about how you put R into Docker containers. Um, me and Heather Knowles have been working on this. If you go to putr.pro.com, you can see us talk a lot about this. And there's a lot of stuff in there about putting Plumber APIs into Docker containers, which is great and important. But it turns out putting a Shiny app in a Docker container also is pretty straightforward and important. And so what I did was I took my Shiny app, I put it into a Docker container, and then I had that Docker container running Shiny server with a single app. And I took that Docker container and I put it into Google Cloud. It turns out Google Cloud was so easy to get this working because you just spool up a virtual machine that's running one Docker container. Um, and then you, um, it just works and it's deploying and it's nice and it's easy. And then you can very easily update the code if you want to, you know, 
push newer versions. And it was far easier than what I was doing to deploy .NET. And so I was just very happy how well Shiny played with Docker and modern um, the modern um, deployment ecosystem. Um, that said, I have like a star on mostly a breeze. I lost a straight week of doing this because Shiny has a weird way of handling environmental variables, which are really important to passing like secret credentials for the, um, the Twitter authentication. And Shiny server like can't handle uh, environmental variables, which is a real problem for Docker containers. And if you Google Shiny server environmental variables, you find a post from Joe Chang in 2015 saying this was not possible in uh, Shiny today. And five years, five years later, it's still not possible without like a really yucky, gross workaround. And I felt like this is a miss. I feel like if Shiny was a little bit more mature of a platform, uh, this would not have been a problem. But besides that, overall, I think uh, deploying to Docker was was nice. Um, with Docker to Google Cloud was very nice. I was very happy. Real win on Chinese part. So the results. I would say that, first off, the full functionality of .NET in, uh, in Shiny, absolutely there. You can pull tweets. You can mash them. You can show them in a UI. Really great. Creating the visualizations was even better than .NET. I really was happy with how easy it was to make a beautiful website with Shiny in a way that is not true about .NET. Um, the UI was less snappy than .NET, and that was kind of worse. And it's not easy ways to try and make it snappier, which is a problem. But the real miss was getting it to handle load, uh, especially if you want to make a simple app that's free. You're not going to really be able to have it handle load in the way that um, other platforms can, and that's that's a bummer. And I mean, that's not really what Shiny was designed for. I get it, but like, it's a bummer. Uh, but it is really nice to deploy this stuff. And even if you don't deploy like I did with Google Cloud and Docker, you can still use Shiny Apps IO, R Studio Connect. There's a lot of ways to deploy Shiny. Um, and I think that's great. So here's my hot take. So I think Shiny is a reasonable replacement for, for a mature .NET platform like that. You know, it's a, it's a pretty good thing, unless you have to do stuff with load. Then maybe, maybe consider not using Shiny as your tool. Um, OK, so. This is going to be, and I can't see all your faces, but we're going to we're gonna have a fun joint exercise. So let's all right now, if you're watching this, go on your phones, go whatever. We're going to go to tweetmashup.com. And I'm really curious if we get the load of 100 people all using this app at once. And I can see, I can go to the analytics. I can see, OK, there are 15 of us all on the site. So let's all just start mashing up people. So I'm going to keep doing Sky Fisher and CNN. Does it work? OK, see, look, I hit go. And already, it's stalling. It's waiting. Um, so probably someone else is pulling in a um, new person. So as you can see, the site when I showed it to you on the um, and when I showed it to you on the local version, it was running fine. But here on the um, on the the real live version, it's not working so well. So just to prove your point. Um, but there's one last slide. So this is going to be my my last slide of my talk. But there's one last um, there's one last thing that happened. This happened. So as I said, I'm presenting at seven in the morning. Um, the last thing that's happened. Um, I'm in a hell of my own design. So this morning, I'm already getting people messaging me saying that my um, my site is down. It turns out 100 people. I, I launched this yesterday, and already people are using it again, and like, and which causing it to break and causing people messaging me. So the problem I have with F Sharp of people are annoyed when it doesn't work is already biting me when we're back in shiny. And so no platform can escape from weird Twitter authentication errors causing things to crash and causing people to bug me. So I guess technology is never the true solution. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jacqueline Nolis. That's my Twitter. And um, Emily Robinson told me she'd be mad if I didn't advertise her book. So I put a banner ad for the book uh, Emily and I wrote at the top of my sites. Well, thank you. And actually, stay here if you're up too late. All right. Well, because I'm about to advertise your book um, because we were doing giveaways. We have a bunch of your books to give away. So.